You're watching Rethinking the Mundane with Joe and Lex. Where an uh, industrial designer and a creative technologist talks about everyday mundane objects and experiences in our lives and try to repurpose them or question their purpose, I say. And today we're talking about traffic lights. Jeez. So, the traffic light is something which, you know, is a... I, there was a quote I literally just read where it's like, uh, a traffic light is a prop, but it signifies a social contract that we have with with the law and is written in law. It's like a, it's like a social contract where you've got this structure in place that demands your intention and almost controls most time your next option, and we've all agreed to it. Yes. And that's an interesting one out of maybe some of the other objects we've spoken about so far because it for it to be really successfully utilised, it requires those like connections and contributions of a, of an entire community yeah. in that period of time to you know, to, yeah, to navigate. I don't know. That that was the first thing that came to my head was thinking about the traffic light was just that social contract or design or it yeah. is interesting also the level of at which people obey it if you're walking you don't obey a traffic light if you're cycling you maybe obey a traffic light if you're in a car you're legally ob- obligated to drive to to obey the traffic light at least in this country and we do uh i think you went on bikes you meant to... i mean yeah you're you're, you're supposed to yeah for sure. Um, but it's it's amazing when you think about it, how they control the movement of people around mm. the city and how much how much work must be done to sort of control that flow of, of traffic of people. Yeah. Um and, but I think there's there's that element of it. The other thing that I find really fascinating is the the way in which Firstly, it's like it's the same in every country. Yeah. At least the countries that have traffic lights. Obviously, you've got green for go and red for stop. I have to think about that. Um, and so there's there's a it's pretty simple. Yeah. But the other thing about it is that it is obeyed to different levels in different countries, which I find equally interesting. And there's a sort of cultural kind of thing there. But I mean, there's a lot to pick apart. You know, but there's also, like you said, there's also countries that don't exist. So yeah, they don't have traffic, traffic lights, lights at all. And they have. So North Korea has just started bringing traffic lights in, but they've historically had, I think they're called traffic ladies, um, and yeah, who, who direct the traffic, especially within the cities. Um, Bhutan has no traffic lights, they only use roundabouts. Um, and I think. Yeah, it's quite interesting. I've never been to a country that doesn't have traffic lights, but I would be interested to experience that. I'm sure it would be crazy. I'm trying to think, does Nigeria have traffic lights? So if anything, Nigeria is watching this, please forgive me for not knowing this. But I can't remember. You know, because I feel like there's that interest. It's an interesting thing when we talk about it. You talk about the, the traffic ladies who, like, that's, it's interesting, right? Because if you think of it, when we talk about that, like that design aspect of it, you've got a human being, where human beings ask you to exist in this form of agency, stop, move, and you can obviously, from an interaction standpoint, you could be like, okay, this is a human being based on that, probably working on behalf of, you know, the local government, local council, whatever, you know, to to manage this thing. I'm gonna trust and respect that person, but then you design almost as like metallic props in a way and then it's like that you know we put we put an amount of trust yeah. in the traffic light system right and you definitely do i mean i've driven through green traffic lights at 50 miles an hour you are putting a hell of a lot of faith in a car not coming out the junction mm-hmm. and you know, it's not always. Sometimes traffic lights don't work, and mm. 
things go crazy. I mean, I live near Mile End and there's a big junction there. And I've been there when the traffic lights haven't worked. And it's mayhem. Mm -hmm. And it, everything just sort of, like it does in the movies. They just yeah. sort they don't crash, but certainly all the, it's just a stalemate and nothing can get through. Uh, and unpicking that is actually really difficult, even for a traffic officer who's you know, experienced. Uh, but yeah, I think, I guess the thing that um, you've you've been talking about and, and maybe done, done some work into is is using the infrastructure of, of uh, traffic lights to create smarter cities. Because yeah, and I guess with the smarter city, the the movement which I don't know how much steam it's had. Like I feel sometimes when you obviously work in this like tech innovation space a lot, it's like you always hear these new desires and new concepts and new things and then they create these mini hype trains and so smart cities was one of them at the time it was this like desire to have this sort of city intelligent city where all the mundane objects from bins to traffic lights to roads to you, you name all of these things which is part of the city is intelligent and has the ability to shape and morph and adapt to the data that's being fed and so where probably the most successful implementations of smart cities has been traffic lights and i guess that's due to you know the the, the sort of logic process of creating a traffic light i guess because it's something that i i still don't understand how it, i guess make an assumption how it works i guess somebody's studying the flow of traffic in this area or in this space and then maybe has a formula, or maybe there's a predict, there's a formula, but the whole aspect of the smart city with a traffic light, right, is the ability to have a camera, you have cameras, you have this predictive algorithms, and sort of you, data is being fed, and the traffic lights are able to adapt to flow of traffic at that time, basically. That's what it is, rather than having maybe somebody doing it on the other end, it's almost working in real time and operating to what it can see and exist. So that's been, at this point, the most successful implementation mm. of the smart city concept at this point is traffic lights in terms of that intelligent I think aspect. something that you said there was interesting is the fact that you've obviously got this connected infrastructure within a city that has power. So within that, you can have a, a set of lights, but you can also have a camera. Mm. And that then allows you to not just monitor flow of traffic but it also allows you to monitor the street the people yeah where people are what they're doing uh in china the traffic lights all have cameras and they can they they use number plate recognition to basically just track where everyone's cars are so they can see if you've gone from one area into another and you may not have a license to drive into that into that space so it basically is like a level of sort of observation and control. And there's always going to be a risk if you bring in um, cameras on every traffic light, how people react to that. Yeah. And you also did a project on hiding your identity. I'm not sure that was specifically in relation to, that was related to CCTV, which is effectively kind of what you're suggesting is putting cameras on. I, I guess that relationship of agency, right? And it's like that social contract that yeah. I think I'm really intrigued by. I guess the, we, we, we all understand, okay, cool, what the importance of the traffic light system. It allows for all of us to get through. It allows for safer crossing, for everybody involved across the different things. You know, you're aware that if you break the rules, you can cause trouble and harm. So there's that social contract. And I guess when it comes into the increase of using these sophisticated systems where we, you know, put a camera, we begin to scan, you know, we begin to track people, then it's almost like that social contract gets how much, because, oh, Jesus, I just hit this mic again. But like, because there's that thing, beautiful thing about agency, right? When you give people agency and with the traffic light, you almost have agency still in a way to, to make a decision and most people tend to make a decision which they will benefit them and benefit the, the side of others. And then when you add these particular tools where it's to track and police individuals, maybe that social contract or that form of autonomy and agency gets flipped on its head now because 
Yeah. You're almost being subservient to this particular system. And what can happen at times is, I guess, when I look at that particular project, the Invisible Mask, where we were looking at challenging this concept of facial recognition technologies, it was because the argument for facial recognition a lot in these particular areas was safety, security, and stuff. But what happens with power and that dynamic of power, right, is who abuses that or what is the agency or the autonomy? How does one, how, what if I want to sign out of a social contract, what could one do? I mean, you have to hide your identity and that particular stuff. And you can imagine if you started adding all these smarter CE tech and all of these things, you might have those particular sort of actors in the space who may necessarily do some troublesome stuff, mm. you know, for slashing paints and you name it. They probably do this now, but it might be, you know, when you design a system, people are always going to try to find a way to hack that. So it's just, yeah. I'm surprised that and maybe there's just not a lot of benefit other than causing mayhem, but I'm surprised that um, the traffic light systems aren't hacked. You know, you always see it in the movies when they like tap into the system and like make all of the lights green for the getaway vehicles. Yeah. Um, I, I'm always surprised that that doesn't actually happen in real life. Maybe there's actually, maybe it does, maybe. I guess with the smart city, because everything be, because I think traditional traffic lights are not connected to the internet. Okay, From so they're, my understanding. they're uh they they've they're programmed and then they're just yeah left yeah to go. yeah I think I think that's the I might be wrong but this is my understanding um where with the smart cities everything is connected to the internet mm. and that was the thing of the internet of things right that connected devices and then you need to have that sophisticated infrastructure and firewall prevention and all these things but I guess at a smart city right. If you can find a backdoor entrance, maybe those scenarios and stuff yeah. can necessarily happen. I mean, the design itself of the traffic light is is kind of is interesting when you start looking at them. And now you're now you're listening to this, you're going to start looking at traffic lights. But how they deliberately filter the light to only be viewed from certain angles, mm. or some of that is to stop light leaking and um maybe disorientating the wildlife and that but also uh to mean that you can't like jump a light or or like sneak through because you're not actually just not sure if it's red or green yeah um but that and, and that's also something that differs from from country to country which is which is interesting although obviously it's always red and green although i've always and been curious to know people can be red green colorblind and whether they then just see mm. how how they see the lights because that's um you know it's, it's all reliant on the color yeah but actually what i was going to say so uh you know when you you know when you like book tickets for something or fill in a form or something and it's like i'm going to check you're a human yeah and you have to click all of the squares that have traffic lights in yeah capture, and, yeah. yeah and that's been you that's being used to train self-driving cars as far as I understand. Yeah. Why do self-driving cars need to recognise traffic lights? Would they not? Because... But like, or actually, if you integrate a smart city, then you wouldn't, the self-driving car wouldn't need to recognise red and green. So, would... I guess the reason why smart cities, I mean, smart, smart self-driving cars maybe haven't, that's a good question, hasn't maybe taken off. They're taken off, but like, explosive yet, is because the roads like on the motorways and all of this stuff at this period of time are still not as sufficient to have that so if you think of it these cars have the the um, lidar sensors and then it scans the world around them it's really interesting to see it in a tesla we see in a tesla interface and then it's able to scan the cars and stuff that drive by it's able to scan the world around it so it's got this constant scanner but i guess it has to be able if you think of it uh, the whole point of training that is a machine learning model isn't a human being. It doesn't have context. It doesn't have knowledge. It's our sets of algorithm being powered to do an instruction. So it needs to be able to detect the traffic light in order to know okay to pause. Then it needs to be able to detect the you know the colors, the filters, and able to move. And obviously, still now smart smart driving cars, you still at this point still most likely have a human input in things. I I still I haven't been in. I know in San Francisco you see a lot more 
self-driving cars they've now got like these like self-driving cab services going on right mm. now i'm no you know and i'm interested i would love to be one myself to understand the process but in order to have like what you mentioned in that question you would need the roads you would need everything around it in order to be connected to the internet to almost have this like on the lion layer of communication that would always be powered probably by like APIs. Yeah. And they would just there be speaking in communication with the cars and all of that stuff. But at this period of time, self driving cars have to adapt to the current roads rather than roads and all these other stuff to adapt. I remember once we were trying to pitch, and I don't know what ever happened. The government was really big on like, we're going to have smart driving cars. I think even by like, this time, like 2023, 2024, or something, I can't remember, or 2025, and we were trying to pitch about a project about how do you redesign the road, like, how do you redesign the roads so that you can accommodate for smart lorries? Mm. And a lot of it was this thing of, we would need to put either, you would need to change the roads and lay them with, like, sensors, because it would have to be this, like, hidden interface yeah. that, yeah, like I said, communicates with the car. And right now, you know, that's a lot of money, a lot of infrastructure projects, that's, you know, but that's where we're at at the time. So where's the way how, you know, smart cities and cars can speak to each other? Yeah. yeah that would work. I think Google had a whole team, sorry to with Sidewalk Labs, but I don't know how much of what's been going on there, where they were like trying to build a smart city in Toronto and stuff. Oops. And I don't know if they did it anymore, because I think local community was against it. I don't remember. Yeah. It's, uh... Yes, it's hard to imagine uh, kind of it working when you've got, like, obviously, if you have a smart city, if you built it from scratch, it would be easy because you would, you know, you would lay everything out. You wouldn't need traffic lights. All the cars would be self-driving. No. It would, all the lorries, all, everything would be, would be really simple, um, would, you know, would be connected. It would all make sense. But because we've got like all of this like legacy tech vehicles that uh, they're going to be on the roads for years, yeah. and you know no one's going to want to move specifically over to self-driving yeah. vehicles. So it's hard to hard to see how that's going to work in the long term. Oh. Um, but but, there's, there's, but even with that, right? The anxieties and attitudes to smart technology mm. is something that's there. I think you know when we did the work when we were exploring with Sabbath about distance citizenship a lot of things was around like socialization of you know how do you socialize these technologies where the local community would be comfortable with accepting these technologies or you know the fear about privacy data a lot of these things there's also that social side of it where right now a traffic light you know we don't even think about it right because it's so ingrained in our lives but if we knew that every traffic light could track us and scan us and stuff. Yeah. What would that, would that change our behavior? Would that change? So there's still that, a lot of things there where it's like, you've not only got the legacy, like components, but you've also got attitudes and anxieties towards, you know. There's a lot of that. I mean, you don't drive, but there's now smart motorways um, that are being put in, in the UK. I have not, got my head around what is smart about them other than they are really annoying and they've taken away the um hard shoulder so they just feel really dangerous because you're in like a four-lane motorway and there's nowhere to go if you break down yeah and it feels as if uh yeah there's so much backlash there's so many people who who hate the idea of it they're obviously now forced into them they've got like always got uh i think the point is is to, to kind of control the flow of traffic so yeah. you should end up getting there quicker by yeah variable speed limits that's the main thing okay so it might you might go on the motorway at one point and it's a 50 and then another time it will be a 70 and yeah obviously until you get on the motorway you might not know what speed yeah. you're actually allowed to go at and they are driving people mad and obviously then the association is with smart you know the word yeah, yeah, smart. smart yeah and so you start saying smart traffic like smart city smart yeah. roads people are already have negative associations with that yeah and so i think it's going to be really difficult to move to get 
a widespread acceptance yeah. of that introduction of tech until people, you know, see, see it work. Yeah. So it's gonna take it's gonna take a long time. But, but if it works. But that's even that thing of that design decision, right? Because I'm even reading it there. Many people are of the this is from the RAC. Many people are of the opinion that smart motorways are more dangerous than conventional motorways because of the lack of the hard shoulder, which you mentioned. Yeah. Seven in ten of those surveyed for the RAC report on motoring in 2019 said that they felt removing the hard shoulder and motorways compromised safety. And but the biggest thing is because of choice. Like, I, I no longer have... No, it's not a choice, but like I know what to do in a situation. If my car has got a flat tyre or something's wrong with it, I go to the hard shoulder. Yeah. Now, it's not clear to me what I should be doing. Mm. Because all the lanes are, con- are controlled. Yeah. The speed is controlled for all the lanes. So all the cars in all the lanes are moving at the same speed. Mm. There's no slower lane yeah. over to the left as there would normally be. Your instinct is always to go over to the left. And the whole point of the smart motorway is it immediately recognizes that there's a car yeah. in the lane. And it could be in any lane. And then you just it just redirects the traffic around that car safely. Yeah. But at that moment, it, it contradicts everything else on every other road in the UK that mm. I would go to the left and pull over if I had a problem. Yeah. And I think it's they've 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 done all these models on computers to see what to kind of control and to see what would happen in different scenarios and they're like, yes, this is it. Yeah. Like when they introduced uh walking on both sides of the escalator. No, sorry, standing still on both sides of the, the escalator. escalator. When they were like it's faster if people stand still on both the left and the right of the escalator and allow it to go up rather than standing on the right and walking on the left. Yeah. And people were like, no. Mm. <laughs> and it, it's true if you model it. Yeah. But the idea that people can't walk up on the left just caused mayhem in, yeah. on the on the tubes because people were like, stand on the right <laughs> and, and, <laughs> and like pushing and, and yeah, yeah, and it was a nightmare. So they took it all away. And... Because it's interesting as you that because that that tension point, right? Because yeah. Highway England had published statistics saying that journey reliability has improved by twenty two percent since the fast smart way was opened in two thousand and six, and that personal injury accidents has been reduced more than half. Yeah, and they're talking about how they run in communication campaigns to educate drivers how to use smart motorways, including the importance of always obeying the red X signs. And apparently, increasingly, emergency refuge areas are also being painted in orange to help drivers spot them. And there's more signs directing drivers to their next emergency refuge area. But there's that thing, right, of when we try to logicize human behavior and we try to maybe, and I think this is a challenge, when we introduce a lot of these, you know, intelligent agents or these models where they're trying to logicize the most unlogicized people yeah. all the time, right? And how yeah, that... Yeah that that social attitudes versus you know how england says hey we've improved this but that daily experience is very chaotic and that's an interesting thing to think about when designing and for those who are interested in designing systems cities and the world and all of that yeah there's so much tension points that you have to adapt but we should probably wrap up um so i hope you've enjoyed us chatting about traffic lights of all things and uh, stay tuned for more conversations about the mundane. And if you have any topic at all that you'd like to chat about, uh, this week the traffic light topic was actually selected by a guy called Rob. So shout out to Rob. Um, and uh, yeah, give us, uh, drop us a DM, comment, like, yes, whatever, and let us know what you'd want us to talk about next. Thank you so much. Bye.